Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. You can go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate, or find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shifting Culture Podcast. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each Tuesday. And once you leave a rating or review, it would greatly help us out. So thank you. Previous guests on the show have included Shayla Visser, Talisi Guerra, and Michael Carrion. You could go back, listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Tori Hope Peterson. Tori is a former foster youth letting her Abba be known. After an adverse childhood, Tori has overcome the odds. Now, she is a leading advocate for vulnerable youth and families, a sought-out speaker, and influential social entrepreneur. On the day of this release, August 30th, Tori's new book, Fostered, comes out. So, go get your copy. There's a link in the show notes if you want to use that. Tori and I have a great conversation around her story, the foster care system, working with the marginalized, and seeing everyone for who they truly are, beloved sons and daughters of God. It's a great conversation. I know you're going to enjoy it. So here's Tori. Tori, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited for you to join us. Josh, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, that's great. You know, I'd love to, you know, you have a new book coming out real soon. You're right on the precipice. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about it? Um, I honestly feel really excited. Um, you know, of course you have, I have nervousness because yeah. there are going to be so many people that know about very intimate parts of my childhood, my adolescence, mm. my adulthood. But at the same time, you know, there's been about a hundred people who have already received the book. And, um, you know, some of those people are complete strangers and just to hear their unbiased, like reviews and hmm. feedback. I'm encouraged. I believe that God is doing something through the book and that's why I wanted to write it. So overall, yeah. I'm excited. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm excited for it to come out, for people to read it, to hear your story. And that's it seems very vulnerable to go and put your story out there. Um, and so, you know, as you've, you've walked through a lot of uh, your life and the traumatic things you've walked through. Can you just frame for us a little bit of your story so that we could have that as a starting point for a, for a conversation? Yeah. So I first went to the foster care system when I was three years old due to a drug bust, um, but the foster care system did its job. I was reunified with my mom just months later. Hmm. But then as I got older, my mom's mental illness got worse. The abuse in our home got worse. And so I had to go back into the foster care system as an adolescent. Uh, this time I went in with my sister and I thought, okay, this is our chance at a normal life, at family. I wanted yeah. to go in the second time. Uh, but that is not how this story went. Um, me and my sister were separated within a month of being in our first home together. Wow. And I had to go move throughout 10 more foster homes until I emancipated the day I turned 18. Wow. And that's, uh, that's rough. That's a lot of moving. That's a lot of different places. Um, and it's separation from your sister and separation from others. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of people in your situation would uh, go into self-preservation mode that, w you know, you need to protect yourself uh, because you've been hurt a lot in the past. And you probably want to protect your sister. Uh, she's hurt as well. Um, how was that process for you? Um, and was there and what started to break that shell that you could figure out how to trust somebody again? You know, I think like the two edged sword, the process, um, it was a very good thing, but also it's something that I still struggle with. Um, it was that I wanted to prove people wrong. There yeah. were a lot of people who said uh, that I was going to be a statistic that said I was going to be like my mom. And that really scared me. There mm -hmm. was a huge part of me that believed that. Like, I didn't know if it was possible to be any other thing. Um, but really didn't want to be. And so I was like, I got to prove people wrong. I got to prove people wrong. Um, but then that, you know, that's a double edged sword because um, then you revolve so much around the opinions of other people, which I think I still struggle with. Um, yeah. I'm still, God is still teaching me 
how to work through that. And so when I think about the process of healing, you know, I used to think that like there was going to be a moment that I was healed, but really I'm just always healing. And I don't know if I'll, I don't think I'll be fully healed until I'm eyes to eyes with Jesus in heaven. Yeah. And I, I think that healing process is, uh, it's, it's long and it's, uh, it's arduous. You know, I, you know, I haven't been in the foster care system, but I did, my wife and I spent uh, five years working with uh, Syrian refugees in the Middle East. And so working with some displaced people that have lost everything, have lost their home, a lot, a lot of them lost family members, um, and we're looking for stability and a place, um, and we're really traumatized. Um, and, you know, one of the things is that we didn't want to re-traumatize people as they're, they're sharing their story. Um, how can people in, you know, in the foster system uh, together, how can you share stories or get to a, a place where you could walk through trauma and get healed uh, without uh, re-traumatizing yourself over and over again? Mm, yeah, that is a really good question. You know, I think I tell people to share from a place of healing. Don't share from a place of hurting. Uh, there have been times <laughs> where, you know, on social media or on a podcast, I have shared something that's kind of that I'm in the midst of. Yeah. Um, and it's hurting me then. And when we share out of a place of hurt, it usually can cause hurt to other people. Mm, yeah. Versus when we share out of a place of healing, it's going to cause healing for other people. So just create boundaries around what you share. I encourage people to write often because when we write, we slow down mm. and um, it kind of helps us refine the message in a way that's not just a story that, you know, draws people in or that, you know, gains attention, but a story that actually serves people. Mm. Mm. And so what are you looking, you know, to serve people with? Um, through sharing your own story? You know, there's so many things. And, you know, at first when I wrote the book, I was like, I want to write a book for the kid in foster care who is like me. I want them to know that they're loved. Like that was the message. I wanted them to know that they're loved, that there was a purpose and plan for their life, that foster care was not the end of the story. And uh, now God has shown me that the story can do so much more than that. And so... You know, people, as they read the book, um, they said that it's really helped them love people better, mm. um, help them love kids who have who come from hard places. Um, it's given them a perspective of foster care and made them want to get involved in some capacity. Mm, that's great. And so I just um, would hope that, you know, that's what my message does. It reaches uh, people who want to serve but don't know how and equips them to reach people like on the margins and who are often left out. Hmm. And that's so important. I mean, if you look at who Jesus was, and even at the very beginning, when he announced his ministry, I mean, he was talking about people on the margins from the very beginning, and that's where he went. Um, and that's who he's for, and that's who he goes after. Um, and if we're really following Jesus, that's what we would be doing as well, is we'd be there on the margins with people and how uh, you've been in the middle of it, right? So you've been on the margin yourself um, and now you're you're going after the marginalized and, and trying to bring them into family as well and saying, hey, what does this look like to, to heal from it? Um, oftentimes what I've seen uh, in the church in the past um, and I've seen it in different places, we look to the margins as a project. Um, and we don't see people. Um, how can we shift our focus to see people instead of a project? Okay, Josh, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I think this is challenging even for someone who literally grew up marginalized on the margins. Like, it's still hard for me, like, to not see, like, a, a certain situation, a mission, mm. a ministry yeah. as a project. And I think the thing that helps me is that I remind myself, I could have so easily ended up in that person's position. And I know that there's a lot of people who can't relate to that as much, but if you really think of it, 
you really could. Like yeah. you could have met a friend that got you involved in drugs and alcohol. You could have been in a car accident that was extremely traumatic. Like we are all just like a snap away mm. from being like the people that Jesus calls us to serve. Mm. And so that's what I try and remember. I try and remember if I was in their shoes, what would I want? How would I want to be viewed? Um, and that really, that keeps me not perfect. Um, in my perspective and in my mission, but I think it keeps me a little bit more focused on the person. Mm, that's so good uh, that, you know, that, hey, let's be in their shoes a little bit. But oftentimes because, you know, uh, people who are hurt, they lash lash out um, and they, you know, as a self-protective mode, they're, you know, trying to say, Hey, I'm going to push you away to see if you're actually going to stay or if you're going to be near me or you're going to be like a lot of other people that have left me. Right. And so when people lash back um, at us, how can we continue to pursue others and love people through the mess and the hurt? Mm -hmm. Again, not perfect at this by any means, but um Something that I always go back to is that you can't make everybody love you, but you can love everybody. So mm -hmm. if you are not being supported, continue to support, can like continually support that person. If uh, someone is not being kind to you, be kind in a way that's shocking. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think when we do that, you know, it refines us as believers, as disciples, but it also draws people into relationships. So when people lash out at us, um, when I've lashed out at people, yeah. you know, my, my track coach, he ended up taking me in and bringing me into his home. Um, and I just remember when I lived with him, I would kind of push him away. I would lash out on him, mm. but he continually pursued me. And so mm. I think that's really uh, when it comes to anyone who is difficult, to try and continue to love them, yeah. love them with boundaries, be kind with boundaries, um, but just continue on the best way that you can. Mm -hmm. Well, you just mentioned your track coach. And so I'd love to get into coaching a little bit. I was a college basketball coach uh, for a little while. And I love I, I love coaching. And I think that that sports um, can do a lot for people to, to grow and to heal and to to, to move forward. What was that relationship for you and your coach like? And how did that, that help you? How did the coach help you? I met my track coach my sophomore year of high school because I moved homes, which caused me to move schools. And uh, there were people that told him, you know, don't be involved with her. She's a bad kid. <laughs> uh, don't like mentor her because he was like, I, I want to help her. Yeah. And um you know, I think it really started with what I say, like he, he chose to see me as God saw me, hmm. uh, not as what the community saw me as, as a t statistic or a file. So we built a relationship uh, just through track. And then between my junior and senior year, we ended up getting really close. And he told me, he was like, Troy, I think you can go on to the state track meet. I think you can win state, which is pretty crazy because <laughs> I've never even been to the state track meet individually. I've been on a relay, yeah. I've never been individually. Um, and you know, there was a, there was a junior who won state. So if I was to win state, I'd be going against a defending state champion, wow. but I was like, okay, I'm just going to like do what he says. And if nothing happens, I'm just going to blame him because <laughs> this was his idea anyway. <laughs> and I did what he said. I trained with him and he just became kind of the father figure that I'd always wanted. Hmm. Um, on my senior track season, he invited me to be a part of his family and then um, a few months later, I went on to win the state track meet and all four of the events that I ran. Wow. Um, that's what got me a full ride to college. Um, and then I was able to become a part of the 3% of Foster Youth to graduate college. Wow. And did you just say right now 3% of Foster Youth graduate college? Uh, yeah. That is a shocking statistic. Uh, that's very, very little. Uh, mm -hmm. As you've continued to to work um, and advocate for people within the foster system or foster system change, is there what are some things that you think that are needed to be able to get more people to a place where that they can thrive um, and graduate college? 
opportunities. I had endless opportunities when I was in high school. I had a phenomenal church that, uh, you know, they would ask me, Tori, do you want to share your testimony? And so I started speaking at a very young age, started writing. They um, offered me an internship at my church. Obviously, I got to um, go to college. And again, that was because of the opportunity of track. And then yeah. college opened, you know, a whole new door of opportunities for me. I was able to go on Capitol Hill and advocate for policy wow. um, to reform the foster care system. And so in all of these different capacities, uh, God was kind of planting seeds, right, for what I'm mm-hmm. doing now. But it was because my community, the people around me were opening up all of these opportunities mm-hmm. for me along the way. Wow. And so what's what kind of a community were you living in where people were actually giving you opportunities and not everybody gets that. So what are the things that you saw in your community that say, okay, how can we transfer that to other communities? Well, my church was very involved in the foster care system. So the leadership were, a lot of the people in leadership were foster parents Mm -hmm. um, where they had foster parents as like foster kids as nieces and nephews or cousins. Um, And I think that automatically you, when you are in the foster care system, you know, like knee deep, you are yeah. educated about what kids need. Um, you're educated about the language and how to not treat those kids differently, how to give them the same opportunities as kids who don't live in the foster care have. So it's very fortunate. I feel like I was in like this perfect incubator that every foster youth should have the opportunity to be in because mm-hmm. of my church. And, um, you know, I had a lot of mentors. Um, there was one named Tanya. She was like a mother figure to me and my track coach. And they just encouraged me. And they're mm-hmm. like, they, they laid out things for me. Like, I think you can do this. I think you can do that. They gave me tangible goals hmm. that um, I could accomplish. And, you know, I, this is like, this is one of the best examples I think I can give is my community. They like, not everyone was certified in foster care, right. And, yeah. and being a foster parent, they used what they had and they used those things to serve me. So hmm. I, when I was in the foster care system, didn't really know how to do my hair a lot. And there was a woman in my church who she owned a salon. So she had my foster mom uh, bring me to the salon and she did my hair for free and taught me. I mean, we sat there Mm. for like two, three hours and she was teaching me like what conditioner to use, what brush to use and how to take care of my hair. Um, She wasn't a foster parent. She just had a salon and then she opened it up. And if you look at my track coach, right, he did the same thing. He, Mm. He wasn't certified. He was just a track coach and he loved the person in front of him. Yeah. Wow. And that's, uh, you know, something that everybody can do. Um, and, you know, we we don't have to be be special to be able to love the person in front of us like we yeah, yes. uh, just have to be who God created us to be as beloved children of him. And, you know, for for a lot of people, for you, I would love to hear how f- you found faith in the midst of uh, this difficult situation that you found yourself in. How did how did God pursue you um, and then find relationship with him? I had a foster mom who was taking me to church um, and I had another foster parent. It was actually the, the foster home right before hers. They were also taking me to church. They proclaimed the name of Jesus, but they did abuse their kids behind closed doors. And so that was mm. very confusing to me. And I'm not saying they weren't Christian. Um but I'm just saying it was confusing yeah. and it made me have a lot of animosity and anger towards God. Mm-hmm. And I, then I told people I was an atheist. Um, but then I went to my last foster home and I think what was so compelling was that my foster mom showed me the juxtapose of that. She really mm-hmm. had a character of Jesus and sacrificed a lot for me, loved me changed her lifestyle so that I could run track and do post-secondary. Um, and I, I saw that. Um, and I felt like God wanted to teach me that, you know, you can proclaim the name of Jesus and you can draw people towards him um, by walking out his character as consistently as we can as fallen people. Um, or we can proclaim his name and we can be inconsistent and have a jaded character. And that's going to pull people away hmm. from him. Um, and he's the most healing thing that I've ever encountered. And so I was very grateful that he kind of gave me this contrast of what walking in faith 
could look like. Um, and then, you know, as she was taking me to church, I was learning about how God was my father. I'd always wanted a father. Yeah. Um, I was kind of mad at God, even though I said I was an atheist, I was mad at him because he didn't give me a father. And um, I realized through sermons and worship that God was my father. He was the father mm -hmm. that I was waiting for that filled every gap and hole that no earthly father mm -hmm. could have. Um, and he loved me and protected me and prepared me in no mm -hmm. way that I could have been by anyone on earth. Hmm. And so you're looking at, at somebody, you know, which God is father and father God that would say, you're mine. I love you. Um, I'm going to be with you. Um, he's speaking life over you um, and through you. Um, it seems to be, you know, that thing, that father heart of God is the thing that started to, to put you on a different track. Uh, is that right? Oh, absolutely. You know, for probably two years, and I'm sorry for anyone who's a theologian and think this is really bad, but probably for two years, I didn't understand that like God, you know, like Christ came and saved me for my sins. Like yeah. I understood like Christ came and saved me so that he could be my father and my friend. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I, you know, got older and, um, grew in my faith, you know, I fully understand. I did not fully understand the capacity of my sin, but I now understand that, you know, that's a huge part of why Jesus came. But for me, for so long, it was really that God was my father and he had um, kind of plucked me out of this place of not belonging yeah. and said, you know, there are people who might not want you in their home. There are people who don't want to text you back. There are people who don't want a relationship with you. But I've built a room for you in the kingdom and that mm. trumps anything and everything where people don't wow. want me. Wow. That's beautiful. And that's something where, you know, a lot of times, even at the very beginning, a transactional, Hey, Jesus came to die for my sins. A lot of it is, is a mental ascent. Um, sometimes and say, yeah, I actually believe that. I know that that's great. Okay. Um, but the actually pursuing suing a, a child uh, from a father's heart is actually something that's transformational because it seems uh, to be an encounter that God starts to encounter you um, and that you can mm -hmm. encounter God instead of you could uh, know about God. There's that the difference between encounter and knowing. And I think that yeah. even, you know, walking with people within the in the system um, you could tell them all the knowledge that they uh, need to change, move, to, to grow, to heal. Uh, but if there's no encounter and there's no pursuit of love with somebody, there seems to be a lack of transformation. Yes. And I can resonate with that so much. I love that that's the way you explain it because I was kind of a bully and not kind of, I was, I was a bully in high school. Yeah. I was one of those hurt people who just went about hurting people, you know, just spoke mean words over people for no reason. And when I encountered Jesus and understood his love for me and his people, I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm causing so much hurt in people's lives. And I, I remember I put out this, like, um, this YouTube video of flashcards and I was telling people I wanted to make it public. Like I wanted to proclaim that I was going to be nice and I wanted to change. Like I wanted Christ to transform me. Wow. That's great. And I think what's what's transformational right there is that you've you saw yourself differently um, from uh, maybe victim to child of God. Right. And so a lot of times we construct our own identity out of the lies that we believe or from the culture around us or the enemy that speaks to us uh, or a situation. Right. Uh, instead of receiving our identity from God so that we can start to live into who we truly are and so we could live into the purpose uh, that God has given us uh, here. How, how do we how have you seen that? You move from a constructed identity um, from what was around you to that received identity from God. 
You know, worship was a place of uh, just there's a lot of clarity for me in worship. Um, and there still is in understanding my identity. And one of my favorite worship songs um, that my church sang often was No Longer Slaves. And it said, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. And, um, and another lyric in that is you split the sea so I could walk right through it. And I really feel like that's what God did, right? Like he split a sea so I could walk right through it. I should be a statistic. I should like, on, like the statistics say I should be in jail, dead. Yeah. Um, like my kids should be in foster care. They say all the things, yet God made a way for me to just walk right through the sea so that I could find him and so that I could be where I am now. And, um, you know, I think there, there are so many, so much confusion around my identity when I was younger. Um, I'm black and white. People can't see me. It's, not, it's a podcast, but I'm, I'm a mixed person. Never felt like I belonged in either community. Um, and then, you know, as I got out of marginalized community, you don't really belong among the vulnerable, but you don't really belong among the privileged because you make mm. them uncomfortable because you came yeah. from a vulnerable background. Um, and then just, just, Oh, you know, always kind of having this thing. I'm like, oh, I don't belong in a home, but always going back to like, God welcomes me into the kingdom mm. and he calls me a child of God. Like it's mm. really, I really have to practice it. I still have to practice it. Um, but the more I practice it, the more peace I have yeah. in the confusion of not belonging. Mm. Wow. And I think that's everybody uh, who hears that. If you could practice and you could hear that you are a child of God, that he pursues you, he knows you, he loves you. Uh, he's like the father in the, the prodigal son story that, you know, he sees his son far off and he runs after him um, and gives him that robe and the, the ring. And he, you know, he parties and welcomes <laughs> him home, right, as, yeah. as his child, no matter what. Um, and that's oh, so beautiful. You know, one of the things that, you know, that I've seen often is, you know, as you've said in the past, you know, hurt people hurt people. And there, and so that's part of, I think, generational trauma is that when, you know, when parents abuse children, children, those children grow up and they start to abuse because hurt people hurt people. Um, and you've gotten to this, this place where you've started to form a different identity um, and start to break some of that um, trauma. Um, and so what is it for you as somebody who has their own family now, um, what does it look like to live in a different place where uh, the generations past don't have to define the generation that is now? Mm -hmm. Well, hurt people hurt people, but heal people help heal people. Mm -hmm. And that's Amen. what I try and remember, um, especially as a mom, because I am a wife, because I want my family um, to be different than the family I grew up in. Um, I want us to walk out the, the character that Jesus um, walked out, and I want us to, to love others. And so I think that you know, engaging in your own healing is really important. That's what I try to do, um, whether that's therapy or being in community. You know, there mm -hmm. are a lot of people who are very angry at the church. The church has hurt a lot of people, and that is very real. But we cannot escape the goodness of the church. We can't escape the goodness of being held accountable um, of the checks and balances in the church. We can't escape uh, being held to that high standard of morale um, and people loving us and encouraging us. And so for me, I always want to keep me and my family in the church. Um, I want to keep us around a community that uh, can uplift us, that can call us out and that can encourage us. Hmm. That's great. And you're right there uh, within community. That's good. So what does it look like? How is your, your husband uh, dealing with all of this? And I'm sure you found a, a great one uh, to be able to, to walk with you in, in all of this. Yeah, oh, he just made an amazing post today. I was blown away when I read it. But 
you know, I feel like I can share because he shared it so publicly and um, it's not something that I've really shared anywhere because I've always felt like it's his story to tell. It's his testimony. Um, and there's so much power when we get to share our testimony. And so yeah. I've always wanted to create that space for him. But he talked about how, um, you know, in the beginning, he wasn't really supportive of what I was doing, um, of kind of, you know, uplifting other people, stepping into ministry, um, sharing my story more. And he said that because he he felt like to be a leader, you know, um, a biblical, what 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 the Bible has said a leader to be. He felt like I had to follow him and his work, but mm-hmm. he also felt confused about what his work was. Um, and so in just encouraging me and in, in my work, um, it's been really cool because he has found out what he loves. Um, mm-hmm. He loves foster care. Um, he loves community. Um, he stepped into a space that he just flourishes and he's a phenomenal dad. You know, I'm on this podcast right now and he's with the kids yeah. um, and I couldn't do anything that I do without my husband. Um, he's my biggest support um, and he's made up for, you know, all the times that he was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> um, he has just supported me really unendlessly. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure that is that is very deep because I don't know, people haven't seen it, but you know when I mentioned your husband, you lit up like you haven't uh, <laughs> this whole conversation. It was a it was a huge smile. Uh, he's uh, it looks like that you really love him and you are very thankful to God for him. He's uh, I'm sure a gift. And you know, there's a lot of times when you know we 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 go through trials and we go through difficult, difficult seasons in our life. And we, we walk through these things and we start to realize that we, or we believe, start to believe, not realize, but believe that we're not enough and we're, and that we don't deserve any gifts from God that, uh, uh, but he wants to give us uh, good things. He is a good God. Um, and so he wants to give us those things. Um, when did you start being able to receive good gifts from God? Hmm. Hmm. You know, that is such an interesting question because (laughs) I feel like for a really long time, even after I was saved, in one hand, I held on to God's grace and God's love, and I knew that I was a beloved child of God. But on the other hand, I held on to I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. God loves me, but no one on earth does. So does it really count? Um, And it's really like not until the last like year Mm -hmm. that I have uh, really stopped holding on to the other hand that says I'm not enough. And again, I think that comes from being in a community that can call me out in truth, that can um, say, give me like constructive criticism, but still love me deeply and never leaves me um, and, ha- and having the same thing in a family um, and in a husband. Hmm. That's good. So how do we ha- get that? And I think that in a lot of communities, if you don't actually... Uh, help people call people out in truth and love people at the same time. You don't create safe spaces where people can start to be open and honest and vulnerable and real um, and say, hey, I'm not okay and I need help. And people say, I'm going to love you anyways, even though you're not okay. I mean, I remember I was in a in a discipleship group when I was a senior in high school um, and I, I, I confessed some sin in my life and the the men that were with me were boys i should say because they i was a, they were boys they looked at me like i was the worst person in the world and they didn't say you know so it felt like after that i didn't want to be open and honest and vulnerable with people i thought i had a safe space how do we create that community and that safe space where people can be open and honest? Because if we don't, if we're not vulnerable, if we can't share our story truthfully, we're not going to be able to move forward and heal as a community. We're going to have all of these these lies or half-truths spoken, and it's 
it's going to be uh, not whole. So how can uh, we do that, that? That is so real because I think that uh, that is a problem, right? I think that's a problem that the church faces right now. We think that um, to be in a position of ministry, to walk with the Lord in any way, you got to be perfect and polished and poised. Uh, so people hold back and they're not yeah. truly vulnerable. Um, and so I think that, you know, of course, there are character standards for, um, you know, being in leadership. But when it comes to just being a member of the church, I do think that we we do need to um, walk in the idea that all are welcome. Everyone is welcome in the body of Christ into the kingdom of heaven. Um, and I think when people tell us things, we need to think about something that um, that I say often is we need to practice our reactions. And I say that because uh, my husband and I got pregnant before marriage and we went to a very conservative college. It's actually coined the most conservative college <laughs> in the nation. Um, and, you know, I, I had no doubt about giving my child life. Um, my mom gave me life in very difficult circumstances. I was conceived out of abuse. Both her parents had passed away and I have always been so grateful for my mom despite all the hardship um and so i was you know there was no doubt that i was going to walk that out and then to be around people who also proclaim those same beliefs but yeah. then uh reacted so poorly to me that was very difficult and you know they didn't need to celebrate the sin they didn't need to condone right. the sin but they didn't need to celebrate the life the very real life that was in me there were people that literally told me not to talk about it and mm. so i think that um and it being my baby, like people told me not to talk about my yeah. baby. And so I think, um, you know, practice your reaction. You know, the, maybe the most Christian girl who's, I was the leader of Bible studies, um, who's the leader of your Bible study is going to tell you something really hard and you have to practice. How are you going to walk in love with her? Mm -hmm. That's good. And that's, it's so helpful to be able to practice those reactions. That means that, um, you know, practice actually is very helpful um, to practice. So if I want to um, do something, maybe I should have conversations with my wife and practice some reaction so that when I do get into situations like that, I actually can react in a better way. Oftentimes, I think we don't practice. Uh, it's just like uh, in sports, right? In track, you have to go and we, you have to practice and you have to, to run and you have to make sure you have proper form. Um, and you're, you know, you're making sure that the moves are, are correct. And if you didn't practice, you know, when you actually had your meet, uh, it wouldn't go so well. Right? right. And so I think even in, in this situation, I think practice is really helpful. And it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what uh, so if you can go uh, go back if you could talk uh, about uh, the foster care system as a system as a whole, um, oftentimes we look at you know the end problem and and try to put a band aid on it. Um, but if we step back and go all the way back upstream, what are some of the, the things that we can do on the back end uh, to create some, something better than what we have now? Yes, you are so right. We do put a Band-Aid on things. Uh, that's how I usually word it. And I think some things that we can do first, I think the first thing that everyone can do, no matter what resources you have, no matter who you are, is we can all change the way we see. The foster care system is viewed as this big, scary thing uh, that we can't step into. But the reality is we have the Holy Spirit that literally dwells within us, which means we can step into the most brokenness of places and bring healing to them. Mm -hmm. And we need to change the way we see foster foster youth because people view them, um, you know, there's a lot of sound bites, stigmas, stereotypes that go along with being a foster kid. Um, and that affects those kids because kids are malleable. The way we see them affects the way they see themselves. And so if we just change the way we see it's going to first push us in to into the way that we need to be involved. Um, but it's also going to help kids see themselves more as God sees them, which yeah. again is like the most healing thing that we can offer children in foster care. And if you want to get really, really practical, you know, caseworkers are over overworked. Um, caseworkers have a very hard job. Mm. They deal with secondhand trauma 
all of the time, taking children out of abusive and neglectful homes. Um, and there really needs to be more support around, um, around caseworkers jobs. Hmm. That's great to be able to think about that as well. Um, you know, secondhand trauma and, and help uh, caseworkers uh, when you have, I think, experienced that secondhand trauma, that probably means that the, the next casework that you have or the next case that you have, you may not be responding in a, in a way that is very helpful um, because you are reacting out of another trauma. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's great to be able to heal that, to be able to see p- the children in the foster care system. Um, are there are there anything um, I there? I know that we probably can't um, correct all uh, abuses from foster care parents. Um, but are there some things that we could do to help eliminate some of those and actually create safer spaces for foster care children? Yeah, you know, um, I think it really starts again, something we can all do is just educate ourselves on what are the signs of um, kids being abused and neglected. You know, often isolation, if kids aren't coming to school as much as other kids hmm. um, and the parent is constantly making excuses for that kid coming, not coming to school, Um, If that kid is often quote unquote sick, um, you know, we should be concerned if a kid is always sick and we should also be concerned if that is a lie or not. Um, There were so many times that my mom pulled me out of school because I was quote unquote sick when actually Mm -hmm. I had like bruises and scratches um, in places that a shirt could not cover. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think we really have to educate on our, our, ourself on the signs. Um, And if we do see something that is suspicious, we need to really look into it. Um, the first teacher that ever said anything, I was in the eighth grade and there were, um, and that's what sent me into the foster care system that second time around. But there were many um, times that I remember I would like lift my shirt up and you could see bruises on my ribs because mm-hmm. I was just hoping that someone would say something. And mm-hmm. I know that there were people who noticed, but they chose not to say anything. Yeah. And it seems scary to say something um, and because you don't know uh, what it is. What are some, so for somebody that wants to practice being able to say something, um, how can we practice? What are some things that I could, can say um, that's, that, I don't know, how can I practice? How can I do that in a, in a way that's helpful? Yeah, I think that um, asking good questions is a really good start. And so if there is a kid in your space that um, may have signs of abuse and neglect, um, just building a relationship first with them by asking questions. And then you can start to ask questions like, what is your home life like? What does your mommy do? What does your daddy do? Um, Really questions that are pretty ordinary, but might um, spur an answer that um, tells us what the kid's situation actually is. And even it's hard in that situation because there, you know, when I was in the foster care system, and I know there are plenty of kids that are told this now, it's, uh, you know, don't tell anybody that we do this. There's a lot of secrets mm-hmm. in um, homes that where, where abuse and neglect is. But I think the more questions we ask, um, the more the more that is revealed. Mm, that's good. Yeah, there's a lot of things that come down to asking good questions. Um, and so, yeah, it's one of the things that, we really need to learn. Uh, there's a couple questions that I have as far as asking questions at the very end here. Uh, one, I usually ask if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? Mm-hmm. But I want you to go back a little bit further, like when you're 17, 18. So f- for you as a in the foster care system, um, what advice would you give yourself um, back then? I think when I was 18, after I won state, I would say you can stop proving people wrong now Hmm. because I just have really revolved a lot of my life around that. Um, And uh, right now, God is teaching me that he defends me and that he proves me um, through his power and through his strength, not my own, and that he is glorified in my weakness. Um, And I think that, you know, proving people wrong when I was 18 and when I won state, like 
that that got me to that point yeah. and i think that it could it was a good like a good healthy thing but um i think the more that it's kind of played out in my life it it hurt me because there are a lot of times you know just being very candid and very honest that um, I can be doing things for myself or I can be doing things for someone else and not for yeah. the glory of God, which is really why I want to, really what, what I want to do. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's so good. And I think we all have to, to do some self analysis and be aware of where do our motivations lie and uh, doing something out of trying to prove yourself to other people as well can can get into unhealthy places that can have lasting hurt. That's so good. Great advice. Anything you've been reading or watching lately that you could recommend? Yeah, I've been watching uh, or I've been reading um, Shauna Nyquist, Cold Tangerines. <laughs> and uh, yeah. she's just a very candid, fun author. She just yeah. writes little vignettes that give life lessons and it's just kind of like, you know, like at the end of the day, when you want to go veg out on Netflix, yeah. I've tried, I love doing that. I've tried not to do that as much. I've tried to just go to like a good, fun read. Um, and Shauna Nyquist has been my girl. Nice. Cold tangerines. That's good. Yes. <laughs> so tell me uh, about your book. Where can people find it? Um, and anything else? How can people connect with you? Anything else you have coming out? Yes, you can order Fostered um, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, wherever your favorite retailer is. And um, yeah, um, that's that's the thing that's happening. And I would be so grateful if people supported me in that. It has been truly incredible to see the, the support around it already. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for everyone who has yet to support me in it. That's good. So everybody run out and get fostered. Um, it'll be a great read. And then it'll be something that you could probably give to other people as well. So don't just buy one copy for yourself. Buy multiple copies and give them away. Um, and let uh, people uh, to read it, be inspired, and get involved in the foster care system and help your church get involved as well so that uh, we could actually see people for who they truly are, which are all children of God. They're beloved, they're loved, um, and they are all uniquely made. And then God has known them since they have been knit together uh, in their mother's womb. Um, and so they are known. And so I just pray that as you go out, you read this, you start to engage and to see people for who they truly are. So Tori, thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I loved it. Um, so I really appreciate you jumping on and doing this. And I wish you all the success with Fostered. Um, and so thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.